the seven-member crew of America's 113th Space Shuttle mission. Exit the crew quarters on the third floor of the Operations and Checkout Building at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. They take their traditional walk to the transporter van that will carry them to the launch pad. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. They lift off aboard America's first space shuttle, the 22-year-old Columbia. The astronauts spend the next 16 days in orbit, conducting dozens of experiments dedicated to improving life on Earth. Finally, each one makes their preparations to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and return home. from landing with friends and families waiting to greet them. Disaster strikes. My fellow Americans, this day has brought terrible news and great sadness to our country. At 9 o'clock this morning, Mission Control in Houston lost contact with our space shuttle Columbia. A short time later, debris was seen falling from the skies above Texas. The Columbia's lost. Having flown in the Columbia, the most difficult emotional part of that for me was looking at my family, my wife and my children, and their emotional response to that loss, and then the feeling, transferring that feeling to how terrible it must be for the families of the people that were on board the shuttle. You have a spectacular team. They still know what they can do. But they're trying to manage a vehicle which cannot be made safe. It's a fantastically dangerous and vulnerable and critical machine. With the loss of Columbia, the world is reminded that a successful mission depends on the performance of millions of parts, systems, and people. With two exceptions, all of America's shuttle missions have met those unwavering conditions. And Columbia blazed the trail. Soon after NASA was formed in 1958, it began testing precursors to today's space shuttle. What has motivated people who are interested in spaceflight from the very beginning is the ability to take off like an airplane, fly into hypersonic and orbital velocities, go up into orbit, fly in orbit, and come back and land like an airplane. That's what everybody wants. And to do that repeatedly, just like we do in airliners today. I believe but by 1961, with the space race accelerating, President John Kennedy had a more immediate goal. Of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Beating the Russians to the moon meant using more readily available, single-use only rockets and spacecraft. But seven years later, NASA's budgets were being cut, due in part to the Vietnam War. Its future would depend on finding a more economical means of exploring space. So by the summer of 1969, as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first human beings to explore the moon, plans for a reusable space vehicle had been revived. The concept that NASA really championed was a, a, a essentially two fully reusable vehicles. As this early NASA animation illustrates, the idea was to mate a pair of winged manned spacecraft. The larger, more powerful vehicle would boost the other to near orbital velocities, then separate and return to a conventional runway landing back on Earth. The smaller vehicle would then fire its own engines to reach orbit. The problem with that, it was exceptionally expensive. And the budget constraints said that's not going to really be possible. Because you would have to develop two full reusable spacecraft. But as plans continued to develop, America was growing more entrenched in Vietnam and struggling with racial and economic tensions. Many voters and politicians alike believed the space program should be abandoned altogether in favor of solving problems at home. Some of President Richard Nixon's closest advisors, however, convinced him the shuttle must be built. 
John Ehrlichman talked about how he had a conversation with Nixon one day in which he says, you know, with this reusable vehicle that can go up into orbit and then return, we can go up and capture Soviet satellites and bring them back. And Nixon thought that was very cool and wanted to do that. Now, the shuttle's never been used for that purpose, but that was a selling point. Nixon would hear one other compelling argument as well. Casper Weinberger, who was at that point in time the second person at the Office of Management and Budget in the White House, made the case in the summer of 1971 that we really needed to approve this new vehicle that NASA was championing, this space shuttle, because we needed to show that our best days are not behind us, that we could do something that is for the benefit of all humanity. And uh, he sent a memo into the president in which he made this case, and uh, Nixon wrote across the top of it, I agree with Cap. It's time to, to do something about this. On April 21st, 1972, Apollo 16 commander John Young was exploring the moon on NASA's next to last lunar landing when Mission Control transmitted big news from Earth. The house passed the uh, space budget yesterday, 277 to 60, which includes the vote for the shuttle. Yeah. 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 that shuttle might be You'll see. Congress had just approved funding for the space shuttle. Young was jubilant, though he couldn't possibly know that nine years later, he'd serve as commander of the shuttle's maiden space voyage. But before that day came, the technological challenges of building the shuttle would nearly ground it forever. If the shuttle's three main engines pumped water instead of fuel, they would drain an average-sized swimming pool every 25 seconds. Space Shuttle Columbia will return on Modern Marvels. When today's astronauts climb aboard the space shuttle, they enter a vehicle designed very much like the one Congress approved back in 1972. The crew lives and works in the orbiter. A combination rocket, spacecraft, and airplane. It is 122 feet long and has a 78-foot wingspan. The shuttle's three main engines, located at the rear of the orbiter, are fueled by a million and a half pounds of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, stored in the 154-foot-tall orange external tank. When the three main engines ignite, it sort of jolts you around a little bit, kind of like riding a 10-speed down a gravel road or something like that. A pair of 149-foot-long solid rocket boosters ignite, along with the main engines at liftoff. The two boosters produce 44 million horsepower, the equivalent of nearly 15,000 locomotives. When the solids ignite, it's kind of like riding a dirt bike down a railroad track. It gives you a pretty good shake. Just over two minutes after liftoff, with the shuttle flying at 3,200 miles per hour, the boosters burn out and are jettisoned from the vehicle. There's a small jolt as they are separated from the shuttle, and then they fall back in the ocean. The boosters are recovered, towed back to shore, and refurbished to fly again. 52 miles above the Earth, the shuttle's main engines shut down as the external tank runs out of propellant. The tank then separates from the orbiter and breaks up as it falls back through the intense heat of the Earth's atmosphere. It is the only expendable part of the shuttle. The pilot then activates a set of smaller, liquid-fueled maneuvering engines to reach orbit. Eight minutes after liftoff, the orbiter is circling the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. Returning home, it endures temperatures up to 2,900 degrees Fahrenheit as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. The orbiter must then glide, completely unpowered by engines, from halfway around the world to touch down on a specific runway. Such performance is still spectacular by today's standards. But the space shuttle was designed and built in the early 1970s, years before Americans enjoyed personal computers, digital display clocks, or even telephone answering machines. 
building the shuttle was just as complicated as going to the moon in many respects. It required technologies that didn't exist. In some cases, NASA engineers didn't quite know how to get to those technologies. They could kind of roughly define what they needed, but they weren't sure how to get there. Developing those technologies would involve the contributions of over 50,000 Americans, working for hundreds of contractors in 47 different states. The solid rocket boosters were assembled, loaded with propellants, and tested by the Thiokol Company in Brigham City, Utah. They're made from weld-free, high-strength steel in a process called rolled ring forging. Each booster contains 11 segments that are joined together using high-strength steel pins. In New Orleans, Martin Marietta was at work on the huge external tank. Since the temperature of liquid hydrogen is 423 degrees below zero, the tank would be encased in spray-on insulation. This would prevent ice from accumulating on its surface in the humidity of its Florida launch site. The most complex job went to Rockwell International in Southern California. Rockwell would design and assemble the orbiter itself. Its Rocketdyne division was responsible for the shuttle's main engines. In all, the shuttle would consist of 2.5 million parts, including more than 1,000 plumbing valves and connections, 1,400 circuit breakers, and 230 miles of wire. I remember when I started on the program, I asked myself, is it possible to do this thing? Is it really possible? Because when you looked at all the things that have to happen, and the time was allocated, emotionally you thought, or intellectually you thought, it's just not possible. But what we did is instead we just focused on the year at a time. On the morning of September 17th, 1976, the Rockwell team treated the world to a glimpse of the future. A test model of the orbiter, one not intended for spaceflight, rolled out of their Palmdale, California plant. It was named Enterprise, after the starship in the television series Star Trek. In August of 1977, astronauts Fred Hayes and Gordon Fullerton would put Enterprise to the test. Their job was to release the 150,000-pound glider from the back of a specially equipped 747 jumbo jet and with only one chance for success, attempt a landing. At 24,000 feet, Hayes fired the explosive bolts holding the aircraft together. And as expected, Enterprise lifted straight up as the jetliner veered away. Five minutes later, Hayes glided Enterprise toward the runway for what would be a perfect landing. But the test only proved the shuttle as a glider, not as a spacecraft. That test would be up to the shuttle Columbia, which was nearing completion but was plagued with two major problems. The first involved the shuttle's three main engines, the most complex engines ever developed. One of the difficult new requirements for this, this rocket engine is that it be reusable. And in fact, it's to be reused for 55 flights. Previously, all rocket engines were expendable. In addition, the engines needed to be much lighter than prior rocket engines. Yet for their weight, they had to be far more powerful, capable of generating 23 times as much power as Hoover Dam. Individual turbine blades were roughly the size of a postage stamp and it developed 600 horsepower per blade. During testing, those turbine blades cracked and nozzles gave out under the extreme pressures and vibrations. It was later discovered that the grade of welding wire used on the engines was causing weaknesses in welded areas. By upgrading the wire and making other modifications, the engines began testing with consistent success. The second challenge that they had was a thermal protection system, or the TPS as it's called. The TPS protects the orbiter from burning up as it re-enters the atmosphere. It would consist of three materials. Reinforced carbon-carbon panels were installed on the nose and wing edges, the sections that encountered the highest temperatures. 
most of the top side of the orbiter was considered least vulnerable and covered with a flame-resistant fabric. The greatest challenge was protecting the largest section of the orbiter, especially the underside, which dissipates most of the heat. These areas would be protected by nearly 31,000 individually designed, lightweight, heat-resistant ceramic tiles. The problem was getting the tiles to bond to the orbiter's aluminum skin. This tile is a ceramic, and if you really looked under a microscope, it's probably 97% air. There's nothing there. It's sand in strands that have been uh, heat treated and then a coating put on. And when we put that tile, attach it to the vehicle, it was breaking at a point where we didn't understand why it was breaking. In March 1979, a blue ribbon panel of experts from around the country began searching for a solution to the tile problem. At the same time, in order to maintain a processing schedule, NASA transported Columbia to the Kennedy Space Center with thousands of tiles still missing. Six months later, the experts determined that the solution was to add a special coating to the back of each tile, strengthening where it bonds to the orbiter. Workers at the Kennedy Space Center would spend until Christmas 1980 modifying, applying, and waterproofing the 30,759 tiles on the orbiter. By the spring of 1981, Columbia, the most complex and expensive vehicle ever built, was ready to fly. Columbia was named for a Boston sailing vessel captained by Robert Gray, who in 1790 completed the first U.S. circumnavigation of the globe. Space Shuttle Columbia will return on Modern Marvels. Prior to every space shuttle flight, a series of events take place at Florida's Kennedy Space Center that is nearly as spectacular as liftoff itself. The shuttle is rolled out of its processing hangar on a 96-wheel transporter and carried to the 525-foot-tall vehicle assembly building, which was originally built to assemble Saturn V rockets during the Apollo era. The newly completed Columbia made this trip for the first time in November 1980. The first time Columbia rolled out of the processing facility after years of work in there and rolled over the VAB, there were thousands of people out there just to watch that short trip between the processing facility and the VAB. All those technicians that glued tile on, all those engineers that wrote software, all those people that worked in logistics that procured parts, everybody felt that they were a member of the team. Waiting for every orbiter inside the vehicle assembly building are the solid rocket boosters and external tank, which have been raised to the vertical position and attached together. A pair of cranes lift the orbiter vertically toward the top of the building, high above the external tank. It's aligned with the tank, then is gently lowered down and attached to it. Next, this slow-moving six million pound vehicle called the Shuttle Crawler Transporter carries the spacecraft out of the building and toward the launch pad. Fully loaded, the crawler moves at one mile per hour. For its maiden voyage, mission STS-1, Columbia arrived at the pad on December 31, 1980, four months prior to launch, for a series of pre-launch tests. The spacecraft was nothing like we had ever checked out or launched before. Most of the checkout with the previous capsules or spacecraft were switches in the cockpit and uh, manual activity. Uh, this brought in a computer complex on board and drove us to more computers in our ground checkout than we'd ever had before. So our engineers had become very proficient in computers and for people that had grown up in the slide rule era, the, uh, this, was a, this was a challenge. The computers would play a key role in firing the shuttle's engines and igniting the solid rocket boosters. The Air Force was telling Congress that the shuttle will lose one out of 30 missions due to solid rocket boosters alone. They said, we're sorry to give you the news, 
but we are operating solid rocket boosters, and that's our record. So SDS-1 had a lot of unknowns. There was a lot of risk taken. The people who flew that uh, really were quite courageous because there was no guarantee. Those people would include NASA's most experienced astronaut, John Young, a veteran of two Gemini missions as well as two Apollo missions, was selected to command Columbia. The pilot was Bob Crippen. Though he was an Apollo-era astronaut and had more than 4,000 hours of jet aircraft flying time, this would be his first space flight. On April 12, 1981, Young and Crippen posed for cameras during the astronauts' traditional pre-launch breakfast. In a few hours, they would be flying the first vehicles sent into space without the benefit of previously unmanned orbital testing. It was almost like Apollo again. We hadn't been in space. In 1981, when they flew Columbia, we had not sent humans into space since 1975, six-year absence. So everybody was excited about this. And then there were all these unknowns about this mission. Would the engine work properly? These shuttle tiles that were glued onto the underside of the orbiter, would that be successful? We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. Space shuttle, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. As Columbia made its ascent, Crippen and Young noticed debris flying past their window. It would later be determined that this was ice and insulation from the external tank, an occurrence that would become common on future flights and prove fatal on Columbia's final flight. This is the SRB set flight. The rest of the ascent went flawlessly. Once in orbit, Young and Crippen's first test would be opening the 60-foot-long payload bay doors. But this procedure was more than a test. Okay, the port door is coming open now. Roger, copy. Inside the doors are radiators that help cool the shuttle. So opening them as soon as possible would be a critical step in all shuttle missions. The doors opened perfectly. But when they did, Young and Crippen pointed cameras back toward the engine pods and saw a disturbing sight. We do have a, uh, a few tile missing off of, uh, of both of them. Uh, off of the uh, starboard pod, three uh, tile and some smaller pieces. And off the port pod, uh, looks like I see one, the full square, and it uh, looks like a few little triangular shapes. NASA determined that since these were the less critical white tiles on the top side of the orbiter, as opposed to the black tiles on the underside, a safe re-entry was still possible. Assuming the tiles on the underside were not damaged as well, nobody knew with certainty whether they were or not. Two days later, Columbia attempted to become the first winged spacecraft to re-enter the atmosphere and make a conventional runway landing. John, we're all riding with you. Back on Earth, a six-mile-long string of traffic was carrying half a million spectators to Edwards Air Force Base in California to witness the historic touchdown. While Columbia was enduring the searing heat of re-entry, Mission Control would lose radio contact for approximately 20 minutes. And they lost it just as they were supposed to, and as you come out of that, they weren't sure that they would hear these guys again. There's concern that they knew some of those shuttle tiles had been popped off during the launch. Well, what would happen? Would there be a burn through of these individual places? Would the crew come back safely? What a way to come to California. They regain the telemetry, they hear a sonic boom as it comes below the uh, speed of sound, they see it off in the distance, and Walter Cronkite literally breathes a sigh of relief, wipes his brow and says, they fade it. Soon after landing, John Young was supposed to remain on board for a brief medical exam. Instead, he came bounding out of the shuttle ahead of time. In a post-flight statement, he explained why. Everyone had said 
that uh, they had shown from an engineering statistics standpoint that it was impossible, impossible, mind you, that some of those critical tiles on the bottom of the vehicle would not fall off. Uh, none of those tiles fell off. And it's all due to the individual effort of the American people. Over the next 15 months, Columbia would fly three more two-man missions to test the shuttle's various systems in different orbits. Its fifth flight, launched November 11, 1982, was considered the space shuttle's first fully operational mission and marked the first time a four-man crew ever flew into space. Columbia would soon be joined by three sister orbiters. Together, they would make space travel seem routine until disaster proved otherwise. Columbia's maiden voyage was made on the 20th anniversary of the first manned spaceflight by Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Space Shuttle Columbia will return on Modern Marvels. During the first 22 years of the Space Shuttle program, few astronauts spent more hours in orbit than Story Musgrave. His sixth and final mission was on board the Columbia. Launched in November of 1996, the mission distinguished him as the only person to ever fly on all five shuttles. And at age 61, he became the oldest person to ever fly in space until John Glenn flew on the shuttle Discovery in 1998 at age 77. But to this astronaut who joined NASA during the Apollo era and played key roles in developing several shuttle systems, flying the reusable spacecraft was anything but routine. The vehicle that we were getting into, it was simply frightening. I don't do this because it's dangerous and I don't do it because it's risky. I do it because I'm a space person and I have no other way to get up there. I certainly would have rather gotten there by Mercury, Gemini or Apollo. Vehicles that are ten times safer or a hundred times safer than, than the shuttle is. Yet throughout the early 1980s, the shuttle would continue with one successful mission after the next. Way out there in the end of the runway, the space shuttle Challenger, affixed atop a 747, is about to start on the first leg of a journey that would eventually put it into space in November. It's headed for Florida now. With the addition of three more orbiters, Challenger in 1983, Discovery in 1984, and Atlantis in 1985, NASA was pushing to launch shuttles as quickly as possible. Turn them around like airplanes initially was the thought. They found out very quickly that wasn't possible, but we could still fly maybe as many as 25 missions a year, you know, one every other week. And, and that was a very exciting prospect. And to get there, you have to push very hard. And so all through 1985, the NASA administrator is, is pressuring the shuttle program to launch on schedule. And if you look at the number of launches that year, they're much greater than in any other year in the history of the program. 1986 was expected to be equally as demanding, and Columbia was scheduled to fly the year's first mission in January. Despite pressure to launch, the mission set a record of seven postponements, four with the crew on board, which included U.S. Congressman Bill Nelson of Florida. Only after the fact did I find out some of the near misses that we had in those four scrubs. Everything is go. The orbiter is on board computers that are on the SRB. We have cut off. We have a cut off. One scrub occurred just 31 seconds to launch when it was discovered that a fatigued technician had accidentally allowed 18,000 pounds of liquid oxygen to drain out of the external tank. Had we launched 31 seconds later, we would have not had enough fuel to get to orbital velocity and therefore, Hoot Gibson, our commander, would have had to put down a fully loaded spacecraft in an emergency landing on a 10,000-foot runway in Dakar, Senegal, where the end of the runway dropped straight off down a cliff in the, into the Atlantic Ocean. Columbia finally lifted off on January 12, 1986, for a six-day mission. The Space Shuttle Challenger, with teacher Krista McAuliffe, was set to launch just four days after Columbia returned home. I don't think any teacher has ever been more ready 
to have two lessons in my life. I've been preparing these since September, and I just hope everybody tunes in. Crystal McAuliffe was going to do this broadcast from space, this lesson from space. It was going to be uh, go literally around the world and, uh, and be taught to students all over. Never before had two shuttle missions been scheduled to launch so close to each other. Weather and mechanical delays, however, pushed the Challenger launch back six days to January 28th. On that day, the temperature was a frigid 36 degrees, 15 degrees colder than any prior launch, and icicles could be seen forming on the launch pad. While the crew was having its pre-launch breakfast, engineers who had designed the solid rocket boosters were warning NASA that such temperatures could trigger a catastrophic failure in the booster's joint seals. The technical decision in those matters has got to be not just analytical data, but it has to be common sense data. Like foot and a half long icicles on the launch pad, you look at the icicles and you say, no, what is this? What are we doing? And you don't go. But the shuttle did launch. And with school children the world over watching on television. The worst accident in the history of U.S. space exploration occurred 73 seconds later. The cause of the accident was blamed on a design flaw in the solid rocket boosters. And on NASA management for putting money and expediency ahead of safety. The Challenger tragedy grounded the space shuttle for the next 32 months. Columbia and the two remaining orbiters were transported back to their California manufacturing facility for more than 200 safety improvements and modifications. There was a major redesign of the solid rocket boosters and improvements were made to the shuttle's main engines. NASA also commissioned the building of the space shuttle Endeavour which would make its maiden voyage in 1992. But perhaps more significantly, NASA's management structure, safety, and decision-making procedures were drastically overhauled. It put control of technical operations in the hands of the technicians again, and they would resist any interference by people who didn't know the technology. And so the launch control director was responsible for launches, mission control was responsible for running missions, and that's the way it went. And I've been incredibly proud of that team, confident of that team. Throughout the 1990s, Columbia flew 16 missions, launching satellites, conducting hundreds of experiments to improve life on Earth, and helping us better understand the depth of our universe. On March 1, 2002, Columbia flew to the Hubble telescope to pay a service call. Among other improvements, the crew replaced a camera with one that had twice the field of view and five times the resolution. Meanwhile, back on Earth, the crew for Columbia's next voyage was busy training for one of the largest science missions ever flown. It would prove to be Columbia's final journey. In June 1995, NASA delayed the launch of the shuttle Discovery after finding that woodpeckers had poked dozens of holes in the external fuel tank's foam insulation. Space Shuttle Columbia will return on Modern Marvels. The shuttle program opened space travel to the world. Columbia alone hosted astronauts from Germany, Canada, Italy, Ukraine, and Japan. In 1998, the first astronaut from Israel moved his family to Houston to begin training to fly on Columbia. Ilan Ramon, married with four children, was the son of a Holocaust survivor and a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force. His crewmates would become like a second family. They were Commander Rick Husband, married with two young children. Columbia would be the second shuttle flight for this Air Force test pilot. Pilot Willie McCool, married with three children. He was a Navy fighter pilot who hadn't yet flown a shuttle mission. Payload Commander Michael Anderson, married with two children. This Air Force pilot had flown one prior shuttle mission. Mission Specialist Kalpan Achola, or KC to the rest of the crew. Married with no children, this aeronautical engineer and pilot was born in India 
and flew one previous shuttle mission. Mission specialist David Brown, the only bachelor on the crew, was a physician, Navy pilot, and flight surgeon, as well as a former circus performer. Columbia would be his first shuttle flight. Mission specialist Laurel Clark, married with one child. She was also a pediatrician, a flight surgeon, and a Navy commander. This would be her first shuttle mission as well. Well, uh, all the crew members were uh, excited about being on the science mission, I, and that's true for any mission that flies in space. The crew's always excited to be there. But this one perhaps even more so, because it's one of the few that was purely dedicated to science. The crew's 16-day mission would require them to complete more than 80 experiments. They were designed to shed light on such areas as combating prostate and bone cancer, kidney stone formation, sleep patterns, and fire suppression. With a huge workload ahead of them, the excited crew lifted off at 10.39 a.m. on January 16, 2003. By initial appearances, the launch and ascent seemed normal, and Columbia reached its planned orbit. The following day, however, NASA engineers reviewed video of the launch. They discovered that 81 seconds after liftoff, at 60,000 feet, a chunk of foam from the external tank struck the protective carbon-carbon panel on the edge of the left wing, an area where temperatures reached nearly 3,000 degrees on re-entry. Since Columbia's first flight, NASA was aware of foam striking the orbiter, but it had been dismissed as a serious safety threat. Yet this strike did concern some engineers. Though lightweight, the object was estimated to be three feet long and struck when the shuttle's speed was about 500 miles per hour. You know what a milk carton is? Try, try something that weighs one and a half times a milk carton. It's in your face at 500 miles an hour. It's going to take your head off. While the crew was going about its work in orbit, NASA engineers had issued reports indicating the strike could have caused a breach on the edge of the wing, which would doom the shuttle on re-entry. However, these were considered worst-case scenario reports, and their managers concluded the strike was not serious enough to pose a danger. In footage recovered after Columbia's destruction, the crew appeared to relish their time in space. Good morning, Ken. Uh, good morning, uh, Paul. And uh, special good morning to uh, my wife, Rona, the love of my life. Baseball. Hey, better, 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 better. Zero G baseball. You're supposed to catch any, huh? <laughs> Bicycle kick. <laughs> wow, Willie, that was impressive. On the morning of February 1st, 2003, the crew prepared to return home. That might be uh, some plasma now. A little north of Hawaii, at an altitude of 75 miles, Columbia penetrated the outer fringes of the atmosphere. Soon after, an orange glow surrounded the orbiter as atmospheric friction began heating up the thermal protection system. This is amazing. It's really getting uh, really bright out there. Yep. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be outside now. Looks like a blast for us. 23 minutes prior to its scheduled landing in Florida, Columbia sailed just north of San Francisco when mission control monitors began showing the first hints of trouble. FYI, I've just lost four separate uh, temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle. There was a halt in the flow of temperature readings from the left wing. Since sensor glitches during re-entry were not uncommon, flight director Leroy Kane was not yet overly concerned. Over the next five minutes, however, more sensors went dead, and the temperature in the left landing gear spiked 60 degrees. The uh, tires still no heat pressure on left outboard and left inboard, both tires. And Columbia Houston, we see your tire pressure Compton. messages, and we did not copy your last. Is it instrumentation, Max? Uh, flight Max, those are also off. Roger, off the
communication with the crew was suddenly lost. Columbia was 39 miles over north central Texas, traveling 18 times the speed of sound, 16 minutes from its scheduled landing. Columbia, Houston, UHF, comm check. While flight controllers tried to reestablish communication for several minutes, Texas and Louisiana residents were reporting mysterious loud noises and fireballs streaking through the sky. GC flight. GC flight. Fly GC. Lock the doors. Copy. At 9.29 a.m., Flight Director Kane declared a contingency, a NASA term meaning the shuttle had been lost. Mission control was locked down. Phone calls were not allowed in or out as controllers began saving and downloading all of Columbia's flight data. Within minutes, a massive recovery effort was begun. It covered a 2,800 square mile area from mid-Texas through Louisiana. Over the next several months, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board would conclude that superheated gases entered a breach in Columbia's left wing during re-entry and melted its internal aluminum structure. They blamed the breach on the foam strike during liftoff. The board conducted tests by shooting a piece of foam from a nitrogen-powered cannon at nearly 500 miles per hour directly at a carbon-carbon panel. Even though the foam struck a glancing blow, it produced a hole 16 inches across, more than large enough to cause the breach. The board also made several recommendations. It called for modifications to the foam on the external tank to reduce debris strikes. It also recommended that astronauts be trained to repair the thermal protection system in orbit and that better photographic coverage be provided between launch and ascent. The remaining space shuttles are expected to fly for at least another decade as they continue to play a vital role for the International Space Station. While various replacements for the shuttle are under study, none are expected to come online in the near future. In the days following the disaster, a memorial service was held on the shuttle runway at Kennedy Space Center. Bob Crippen, Columbia's first pilot, talked about his old friend. I'm sure that Columbia, which had traveled millions of miles and made that fiery re-entry 27 times before, struggled mightily in those last moments to bring her crew home safely once again. She wasn't successful. Columbia and the other orbiters were all named after great explorer ships, for that is their mission, to explore the unknown. Columbia was hardly a thing of beauty, except those of us who loved and cared for her. Many said she was old and past her prime. Still, she had only lived barely a quarter of her design life. Columbia had a great many missions ahead of her. She, along with the crew, had her life snuffed out in her prime. There's heavy grief in our hearts, which will diminish with time, but it will never go away, and we will never forget. Hail Rick, Willie, KC, Mike, Laurel, Dave, and Alan. Hail Columbia. Tonight on Modern Marvel's Wednesday. So, when you think of a warrior, does this kind of look come to mind? I mean, check out the protective headgear. And what about these super sharp woolly gauntlets? Seriously, though, this was standard army gear for some of the toughest fighters in World War II. The Winter Warriors on Modern Marvel's. Tonight at 8 on the History Channel.